Hey everybody, welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simi. We're in the 90 Min studio and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a really special guest today. Uh, a good friend, he's a footballer, he's a broadcaster, Jamal Fifield. Welcome. Thank you for having uh, me. The show, mate. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Can't complain. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Pleasure is all mine, mate. Pleasure is all mine. Um, Really keen to get your thoughts on, on lots of different subjects. Obviously, someone who's in and around the game all the time, uh, who lives and breathes the game more than I do. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, really wanted to get your thoughts on Arsenal, on, on your career, um, on the season so far. I wanted to talk to you as well a little bit about the World Cup and the fact that that's slap bang in the middle of the season, what yeah. kind of impact that's going to have. So lots and lots to talk about uh, today. Before we dive into it, if I could just ask, please do leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and if you're listening on the audio platforms, then make sure you leave us a review there as well. So uh, Jamal currently plays for Boreham Wood, a club that have got really close ties with Arsenal. How is that? Does that kind of spill over into sort of the day-to-day -day of Boreham Wood? Oh, massively, you know, we've got their... Um we play on their pitch, basically. Um, we share a pitch where their ladies and their um, youth teams play. Um, and you can actually see the Arsenal effect around the ground. Like It's just a bit of touch of class, added with the Bournemouth stuff as well. So in the, in the change rooms, you've got the Arsenal crest next to the Bournemouth crest and nice little leather chairs instead of the <laughs> usual plastic that you usually get at non-league. But yeah, listen, um, we've got a great relationship with Arsenal and um, at times you get to catch a women's game and, and we play them in the um, pre-season and it's really good, you know, to test yourself against the best. What's it like playing against Arsenal, being an Arsenal fan as well? Like, do you have to pinch yourself? When oh, 100%. Around? So our first, our first, um, my first season, we played Arsenal when Aubameyang was, um, when he first signed and he scored a hat-trick within the first I think it was 15 minutes and I, luckily I was, on the, I was on the bench so I got to take it in for the first half but it's amazing you know I played against Aaron Ramsey um, and those guys are in third gear like they're not even breaking a sweat when they're playing against us but it's amazing to see you know especially the little things that they do on the ball off the ball um, the rotations that they have and the calmness that they have and their management staff as well it's, it's, it's good to see even though it is a pre-season friendly, you know, what do you guys do like in terms of takeaways from that? Will you spend a lot of time sort of looking back on that game, trying to work out what they did and, and try and take things from a side that are obviously at Premier League level? Well, yeah, definitely. You know, um, I know the, uh, our gaffer, Luke Garrard, um, talks to whether it's Emery or Arteta or any of the managers that come and he, he tries to pinch a little few things that he can. Um, but no, for me, it's just about how they prepare, so the, how they warm up it before a game, um, what they do in terms of, are they going full throttle for a warm up or are they taking their time? Yeah. Um, it's just it's just something that you can you can learn from, you know? Those are guys at the top of their game, world-class players at the end of the day, so it's really good to see. This season, we got to play their under 23s, and even the same with them, the way they prepped, you know? They've got some good players in there that are coming through, and a fan like me, I get to see a little bit of the future, and it was good to see. No, it must be nice. It must be nice, but surreal at the same time. Definitely, definitely. Absolutely. I don't want to, like, for me, I'm a tough tackling centre-half, and of those pre-season, I'm not going to tackle them that hard because they're my boys at the end of the day. Like, they're, they're my family, they're Arsenal, you know, so I don't want to take them into the season with no, any injuries, but no, nah, it's, it's a good experience. No, good stuff, good stuff. Um, let's get your thoughts on Arsenal's season so far. Um, I know it's not possible for you to watch every single game because you've got your own commitments course, as well, but I know you're right across it. So what have you made of Arsenal's start to the season? What are the differences that you see now that maybe weren't there last season? Um, I'm seeing continuity. I'm seeing a more together group. Um, I think Mikel Arteta has really um, got his points across and, and you can see his stamp being being placed on the team, you know. I think it's been so important that we've had a settled back four um, and the goalkeeper's filling, filling the whole team with, with confidence, you know. But um, I've been really happy with it, obviously. But at the same time, we haven't even got to 10 games yet. So I'm a bit wary of jumping the gun and saying, OK, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Um, but no, look, we played some teams that maybe we're expected to beat, but at the end of the day, it's a Premier League, so every game is going to be tough. And in, and in recent years, we haven't beaten those teams, you know, we have had a couple of bogey skins, but I think it's been really good. Um, and if we can continue going along the path we have, obviously we had a blip against Man United, but that game could have gone either way, you know, so I've been really happy so far. You talked about the continuity and obviously as a centre-half yourself, how important is it as a centre-half that you know the guy playing next to you inside out, that you know the goalkeeper inside out, yeah. that you know what to expect from the players around you? Because I think early in the season, we saw an own goal, didn't we, from William Saliba, mm -hmm. who's been brilliant, by the way. But 
it was it, for me the the reason that own goal came about was maybe because he wasn't totally aware of what Aaron Ramsdale was going to do, and the fact that Aaron Ramsdale would be already on his toes, yep. already halfway towards the ball, yep. and they just caught each other out. So how important is that knowing each other inside out, especially in the defence? I think it's massive, you know, um, and and also for him being such a young centre half, I'm kind of glad he made the mistake so early just to see how he reacts to it. And have you seen he scored two goals? He's we've been in clean sheets. So he's come on leaps and bounds from that loan spell they had last season. I think it's so important just to know that, okay, if I'm playing centre half with um whether it's Inchenko to my my left or um Gabriel to my right, I know the fact that what he's gonna do next, you know, so I can cover him. I know his strengths and his weaknesses. And at the same time, they're all from different places, but as long as they can they talk in the same language on the pitch, that's what that matters. And you can see that, you know, it looks like they spent hours on the training ground. And even the guys that are coming in, whether it's Tierney or, or Zinchenko, everyone's um, playing off the same sheet. Everyone's understanding what their roles are. And you can see it. It's really coming together. Um, and I think Arteta will be happy. And I think the boys at the back will be as well. It's not every day that we've got professional footballers on the podcast. So I want to sort of try and tap into your, yeah, yeah. Uh, your, your your own career, your own experiences as much as possible. Have you ever been in a situation like William Saliba where maybe your relationship with the manager was in question? How difficult is it to overcome that? Because obviously he, he wasn't wanted. Let me rephrase that. It's not that he wasn't wanted, but Arsenal didn't feel he was ready. ready yeah. And he was sent out on loan and he didn't like that. It is clear as day. You know, I think Arsenal were wrong to not register him the way they did yeah. and to leave him essentially for six months doing nothing. I think they handled that really badly. Yeah. So have you ever been in a situation as a player where you've not agreed with the club's decision and then you've had to kind of put that to one side, overcome it and just focus solely on your game and, and then almost had that vindication later on where you go, well, I am good enough. Here I am. Yeah, definitely. I think as a footballer, every single day you're tested. Every single day you've got to prove yourself and whether, whether or not you played well yesterday or the game before, today's a new day and you've got to do it over again. So you're always being judged um, and there's never a day that you can take your foot off the gas and think, okay, I've made it, you know? Um, and that has happened to me. I was put on a transfer list by one manager and said he didn't feel that I was um, up to the task. He didn't feel I was part of the group. And I had to show him the opposite, you know, I had to go in there and get my head down in training and, and prove him wrong. But at the same time, I was proving myself right that I was part of it and I was good enough to play, you know. Um, and I think that's what he'd done. Of course, of course he was unhappy to go on loan. Um, he would have his aspiration to be an Arsenal, uh, Arsenal regular. But he went away like a good player does, got his head down and proved everyone wrong and proved himself right. And now you've seen what he's, what he's made of, you know. He's come in and everyone's raving about him, you know. But it's now about consistency, especially for young centre-halves. A player like me, 33, I, I've been... I've played over 300, 400 games um, at my level, so I know what it takes. But it's that consistency that if he can show that, then I think it would be great going forward for Arsenal. Does it put you in a power position as a player when you kind of prove someone wrong in the way that William Saliba has or the way that you did to your previous manager who, who put you on the transfer list? I mean, not so much a power position, but you can definitely have a little smug feeling of to say, I told you so. Mm. But at the same time, it's the manager who's got the power. So, and there's always players knocking on the door, you know, so it, there's competition at Arsenal squad. And I think that's why we're doing so well, because whether or not anyone's playing, whoever's playing, the next person that comes in is doing well as well, you know. So that's why we haven't dropped any, um, so many points this season, because everyone is pushing each other, I feel. Um, and when players know that, yeah, I'm going to play regardless if I play well or I play badly, that's when you start seeing dodgy performances and inconsistencies. But um, yeah, I definitely think he, he can be proud of himself. But as I said, it's a long, it's a long old season, you know. You're not, if, if he was to have... Uh, dipping form now no one will remember the first eight or seven games he played you know so yeah. he's just got to keep it going yeah absolutely absolutely indeed um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the attack because I think for me the big change has been there yeah. I think defensively yes Arsenal are looking good but I thought when Tommy Asu Gabriel White and Tierney were all fit last season the defensive unit looked pretty good yeah. so although Saliba's come in and been brilliant that wasn't really a big concern for me going into the season. My concerns were further up the pitch, where I think we struggled to score goals. We struggled to create enough chances. We struggled to be clinical when it mattered. And we brought in Gabriel Jesus, who has been unbelievable. Yeah. As a centre-half, you must look at him and think he is a defender's worst nightmare. 100%. But going back to what you just said there, even Ben White going out to right-back, he could have easily kicked his toys out of the pram because he's been moved. But... Even he's taken it upon himself to be the best right back he can be. Yeah. He's been leaps and bounds doing, his, doing really doing his thing, you know. But going back to Jesus, he's been unbelievable. 
I, I prefer to play against big strikers because all they want to do is fight and I enjoy the fight. It's when those, they're nimble and they're sharp and like, he, he's so bright upstairs, but at the same time, he's quick. So you've really got to be on your game against um, someone like Jesus. And you can see how many chances, they, they, the boys trust him, you can see that. They want him to score. A little similar to um, Haaland at City, you know, they want him to score. They're giving him the, um, the balls in the right areas. And he's been finishing them. You know, he scored four goals so far. And um, they're all that attack that, that Artel is going with. It's so balanced, you know. It's like a player with, with, with his experience, with, with his know-how of winning, because him and Zinchenko are used to winning. So they brought that along with them as well, you know. Sometimes you bring players in who are not used to it and they just go wrong with emotions, but they've been at a high level and a high standard, used to winning for years. So they just want to carry that on. How important is that, knowing how to win, that know-how, the experience? Because it can feel like it's one of those cliches that people throw around all the time. And, and I do think at times people are guilty of that. But as someone who's, who's been there, done it, who, who plays the game at yeah. a very good level, how important is it to have those people in and around your group? And what do they bring that's different to everybody else? It's massive, you know. And although they're both young guys, they've been around it, you know. They've won Premier Leagues. They've won um, FA Cup. So they've done it all. So what, what they want is they, they're used to it. And the more you win, the more you get used to it, the more you want it. You want to keep, you keep proving yourself. You can keep saying, so, okay, I can so, do that. So that thing that people say, well, this guy's won it or he doesn't care anymore, that's, that's a myth in your eyes. Don't get me wrong. There are some people that are chasing it for so long. When they get it, they, they do take a, uh, mm. a back step and they think they've made it. But you see the way both of them run and you see when Zinchenko's injured, how he's, how he's around the group. It's massive, you know, and, that, and that's what it takes to win. That know-how, winning football games is not easy at any level, you know. Seeing a game out in the last 10 minutes when it's 1-0 or it's 1-1 one, one, you're away from home and you've got to get away with a point. It's massive for, for a team's understanding. Um, and even though they're young, they're the leaders out there and you can see that they've come from a, a place where they're used to winning, like winning's in their DNA, you know. Um, and I'm sure that players like those, they t even from, that, from the training ground to the games, they take it just as serious. What do you think should be the objective for Arsenal this season? I mean, at the start of the season, I was very much of the opinion that it was top four. Need to get in the Champions League. Yep. From someone who's been in a dressing room, would, would you expect that maybe that objective is slightly adjusted given how they've started the season? Or do you think they'll be desperately trying to keep everyone's feet on the ground? I think it's best to keep your feet on the ground, personally. And I don't think the objective should change, you know. Obviously, if we do better than what we first set out to, that's great. But I think the top four should be what we're aiming for because it's either top four or win it, right? Yeah. Let's be honest, yeah, yeah. you know, it's either top four or win it. And are we, are we good enough to win it? Of course. Will we win it? It's a different, it's a different story, you know? Um, but there's so much firepower at the top of that league with the Man Cities and um, Liverpool. If we finish in that top four, I think it'd be a real achievement. What do you think about like the, the squad size? Because again, that's another really contentious thing when it comes to Mikel Arteta. Has he left it too thin? Or is there something to be said for having a smaller, more engaged group, which I think is what he's trying to do. I think he's, he's of the opinion that I'd rather have 23, 24 players who are all in on it, who are all engaged, all feel like they're part of the team, as opposed to having those extra three or four I don't want to call them outsiders, but players that are kind of, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Because we've had loads of them over the years. Is there something to be said for having that smaller group? I know it can be yeah. strenuous yeah. in one way. I think, I think what we've got to remember is Arteta's fairly new. So for him, I think he'll maybe find it easier to deal with a smaller squad at this moment in time. I think when we become more experienced um, and, and more know-how of how to handle players and how to handle, and he's been a player at the highest level as well, but being a manager is completely different. I think it's easier to keep a smaller group happy um, and content rather than a big group where you're going to have to leave players out. And I think that's the hardest job for a manager because every single player comes in and gives their all on the training pitch, but there's only 11 people that can start a game, you know? So um, I think, yes, we, have, we, are, we are a little bit thin, but at the same time, as you've seen, when there's been players out, whether it's Xhaka, whether it's Partey, whether it's um, Odegaard coming out, the people that have come in have done really well. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a measure of how well Arteta's has done to keep those guys happy, keep those guys, um, give them like a carrot dangling in front of them, like, mm. okay, you, you may get your chance, you may not, but when you do, you need to prove me, prove, prove that you deserve to be in. Um, same to uh, Nketiah, you know, he's gone in there and scored a goal. That's what we need from him. Like, you're not getting your chance, and when you do, what are you doing for us? So I think, yeah, it is, it is a little bit thin, but I think for the time being, um, I think that's the best way forward. But time will tell whether or not um, it becomes a hindrance.
can players hanging around whose futures are uncertain be a real problem behind the scenes? It can, it can, um, but that's down to the, the personality of the player, you know, and at the same time, it's for Arteta to, to, make, to make them understand that, okay, yes, um, you might be unhappy of not playing, but your next move depends on how you behave this year, you know, um, a bad egg or, or, or a player that isn't involved isn't really going to get the best move at the end of the season, it's just, it's just a fact, you know, um, so I think it's, it's going to be um, interesting how Arteta um, grows from this season, um, and managing the expectation of, of where, what, how well we're doing. Um, but it's all learning curves for him as well, you know. He's still, still fresh young manager. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how he handles it all. Yeah, me too. I've been, I've been so sort of pleased with what we've seen probably in the last 18 months. I would say before that, there were times where I asked questions about it because I thought it was a huge risk for a club like Arsenal to go and appoint Mikel Arteta. They obviously thought that it was the right move. They took that decision. They've then gone on and you know, backed him in the transfer market, not just in terms of, I always say this, but not just in terms of bringing people in, but kicking people out, yeah. you know, cancelling contracts, paying people off to get them out the door. Mm -hmm. That's just as much of a, a significant sign that they're backing him as, as, as I say, yeah. bringing people in is. But I, I do think it's taken a bit of time to be able to see what Mikel Arteta was trying to get to. And so the people that were Arteta out at the beginning you know, I don't look at them and think, well, you were completely off the mark. There were times where I had wobbles yeah. and said, I'm not sure that this is working. But I think now we're at a point where it is clear as day what he's trying to do. Yeah. And it's clear as day that we're progressing, right? Definitely. Um, there seems to be a long-term plan. Um, we're not just buying players for the sake of it, panic buying now. Um, and I think you see a lot of clubs in the Premier League are doing that. You know, they want instant success. But I feel as though if we hadn't won these eight games, there wouldn't have been uproar upstairs for, for him. Um, I think for the fans, obviously, because we always want instant success. Mm. But you can see that there's um, a detailed approach, um, a well thought out process of what we're trying to do. Um, and, and he's been proved right, you know, by the players he's, he's let go. And, and there was a, a few players that we thought, oh, he's a great player. Are we sure we should let him go? But the team harmony is so important. And if you haven't got team harmony, it doesn't matter how well you're playing, you're not going to have success. Um, and I think he knows that from being a player, you know. As I, as I mentioned earlier, like bad eggs will derail the season, will derail the team. So it's so important to get that um, camaraderie in a, in, a, in a team, you know. So as you said, how we started is down to him and, and, and his vision. And we're playing in his way um, and long might continue. Do you think players find it hard when managers come in and completely sort of rip it up and say, well, this is the way we're going to play now? Like, Obviously, you must have been in that position where you've gone either to a new club or a new manager's come in and all the fundamentals that you would have done week to week have just been essentially ripped up. For an has, it, has it changed that much, though? Because we've always been possession-based. Mm. Um, we've always been high tempo, moving that ball quickly. Has it changed that much, would you think? I think for me, what's changed is is what we do off the ball more than what we do on it. Mm -hmm. I think there are clear patterns of play when we've got possession that maybe you didn't see in the past. For example, the the idea of the fullbacks tucking in. Yeah. I think under Arsene Wenger and under Unai Emery, there was a big emphasis on them going on the outside and attacking that way. So I think there are changes in you know in possession as well. But I think out of possession is where we've seen the big difference. Yeah. The pressing, I don't think, you know, I felt like Unai Emery tried to implement that at times and it was kind of half assed It was, you know, the front line would do it, but if the midfield don't back it up, then it doesn't really yeah. work. And I felt like we got exposed a lot because of that. Um, but yeah, off the ball, I think there are differences. I think there's a demand now. There's more of a demand on those players to make sure that they are always at 100 miles yeah. an hour. And I actually think that at times we've, we've run out of steaming games. We've had to make changes. Maybe the fact that we can make five subs now. I mean, w w what's your take on that as well? Because, yes, it helps keep more players at a higher physical condition yeah. on the pitch. But it completely changes the game, doesn't it? It does. It does. But that's when, as a player, you've got to buy into what the manager's doing. You know, you have to, when you do get your chance, you'll go in there and show him that, OK, I, you can trust me. Um, I'm a player that you can put your faith in that when I go out there, I'm going to implement the style that you want me to. Um, and, I, and I agree. Um, the best teams defend when they have the ball. And that might, that might be, that might not make sense to a lot of people, but okay, are you in a position that if this ball does break down with Jesus or Saka, who has also been unbelievable, um, 
or, or Martinelli, are you in a position to win it back? You know, that counter press, yeah. you know? So I think it's really important. And I think that's, a, that's another reason why he's gone so young, because I think it's easier to mould a player um, that's younger than maybe a seasoned professional, you know? Mm. There are some players that obviously that are older that will take on, on board your information and, and your style. But I think it's a lot easier to mould um, the young boys and get them... Get them um, into shape and how you want them to. But I personally think the five subs is really important. I think it's really good for, for um, team unity as well. Because you, you've always okay. got, you're always thinking, okay, there's a chance I'm going to come on here. Because usually if it's, if it's the second sub went on, we're all looking at each other as a third sub, like, who's it going to be? And yeah. as soon as it happens, everyone just sits back, takes off their shin pads and the game's over. But now it's five, everyone's investing in the game. Yeah, so it goes back to that point we were making earlier about having people that are invested all the time yeah. and that keeps them switched on. And, and it gives you the ability as a manager to, uh, yeah, you know, we saw at the weekend, 15-year-old mm-hmm. brought onto the pitch, yeah. Ethan Waneri. Um, I was on Toolsport yesterday at the time of recording, uh, Toolsport 2, and I kind of retaliated a little I bit. I saw you on Twitter. Uh, I saw you. I saw <laughs> but that you. wasn't even the worst of it. <laughs> was it Cundy uh, who said it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what do you make of that? I'm interested to get your take on that. I think if you're old, if you're good enough, you're old enough. I agree. I agree. Um, I think it would be interesting to ask him: Did he think that when uh, Matthew Briggs made his debut, or um, Harvey Elliott made his debut, did you think that of a manager? Or is it just the fact that it's Arsenal now and we're doing well, and everybody seems to have something to say about us? You know, that was literally my point. I, I literally said it's as if you run out of things to talk about. You've run out of things to criticise Arsenal yeah. for. They, you, you thought they were going to go to Brentford and be bullied. They went to Brentford. They won handsomely. Mm-hmm. And so your only angle here is to pick on the one decision. Yeah. That maybe there's some debate around. I mean, I accept that there could be a potential negative to bring in on a 15-year-old in that it sets the expectation of him. For, for maybe the boy. Too high, for maybe the boy. for the boy as well. I don't know. But let's be honest, though. Every kid in the um, Arsenal's 23s thinks they can play in the Premier League. Yeah. They all believe that. Also, I saw a clip of the under nines um, celebrating when he came yeah, on. Yeah, I saw that as well. So it fills the whole club with hope and a more, even more ambition than we had. So those boys are thinking, oh, five years' time, that could be me. You know? And the statistics will show that um, some, of the, some of the boys that came through and, and made the youngest um, ever appearance haven't gone on to do well but there are some that have like Cesc Fabregas you know Jack Wilshere they've, they've had great careers so um, I, d- I don't think there should be a negative you know I don't think we should bash M- Mikhail Teta and I think we should support the young boy which I'm sure they're doing you know I, I, yeah. I, I heard they were talking about yeah it's just for Edu um, and Arteta to stroke their ego I, I totally disagree I don't think yeah. they woke up and thought do you know what Whenever I get a chance, I'm going to put him on. No, he's probably deserved it by how he's trained in throughout the weeks, throughout the months. Um, that's just not just a split decision on the spot. You yeah, know? absolutely. And, it, and as you say, you know, they will have felt that he could handle it. They will have felt that he could deal with it based on what they know about the player already. Yeah. And also the point that people seem to miss, and it's, it tends to be people that aren't Arsenal fans, right, that casually follow what's going on at the mm-hmm. club, is that Odegaard, Zinchenko, Emil Smith-Rowe, who all would have been midfield options, were missing. Hence why yep. this guy was on the bench. That, that's why the door yeah. was open. And let's not forget, if there's anyone that could help that boy through, it's Odegaard. Because Odegaard made his debut at a young age as yeah. well. And Went to Real Madrid at 16. There you go. And although he didn't make um, make what he would have wanted at Real Madrid, that's a tough club to pl- come through anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone, um, he's now at Arsenal and he's the captain. And even him being captain, um, it was a surprise at first for me. But... I think he's taken the most fabulously so far. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about him. I think I think he's got the right people around him. Um, to to make your debut at fifteen, you've got to have some sort of um, groundness too. You know. So what? Why was the Odegaard thing a surprise to you? Is it because for me, one of the things that I was trying to fight with in my own head was like, yeah, I think he'd be a good fit. But in my head, a, a captain should be a centre half or a centre midfielder. Right. Is that what right. is that what the problem was similar, for you as well? Similar. I thought a number ten. In my experience, number ten usually gets subbed off okay. at some point in the game. So does that mean that the captain's armband is always going to be moved around after a while? But it was more because the his his position is dependent on how he facilitates in his role. You know, um, but the way he's gone about it, he's, he isn't just a ten; he's an all-round midfielder. Yeah, and I think that was a surprise for me. And I thought also, okay, he was on loan before, and now you're straight up to be the captain. And I was like, okay, well, you know what? 
Let's see how Arteta deals with it. But I think it's been a brush of fresh air, Xhaka, this year. I think that's the, res the responsibility of being the captain maybe have been too much for him at a point. Um, and I think that's freed him of that. So that's why I think his performances have, have gone up a level as well. Um, but yeah, it was mainly due to his position. Um, and looking at the Arsenal captains of old, I, I grew up on Vieira and Tony Adams, you know. So now I'm seeing Odegaard with that yeah, armband. I'm yeah. like, OK, but looking around, who else could it be? You know, there's yeah. not many other options you know but um but yeah i think it's one of those things where we just have to kind of get out of that mind space that we've been in for years like you think of a captain as this vocal you know really dominant yeah. character yeah. almost intimidating character in the way that maybe tony yeah. adams and patrick vieira yeah. were but nowadays that role has changed it's Definitely. about being the manager's voice on the pitch it's yeah. about being um you know someone who leads by example and i think yeah. tactically martin odegaard is totally on the same wavelength as Mikel Arteta and he'll trust him mainly because of that. And and you can see he's respected, you know, you can yeah. see he's respected when he when he talks to players, they're all ears, they're they're listening. Um and as you said, obviously Arteta um trusts him mm. um and he's his voice on the pitch and that's what a captain should be. Um I think it's interesting that he's so young. I think that shows the maturity beyond his years, um to be leading players that are older than him. I think that's massive. Um but he's done really well. Um, so right now, he's proven a lot of people wrong. Absolutely, he is indeed. Uh, Jamal, thank you so, so much uh, for coming down to talk Arsenal with me. Really, really appreciate it. Um, let people know how they can follow you on social media as well and um, and how things are going, basically. Yeah, yeah. I'm on um, Instagram um, and Twitter. Um, just my name, Jamal Firefield. We'll make sure that they're in the description the links uh, so that people can follow. No, brilliant stuff, Jamal. Thank you so much. And we're going to be uh, recording another piece of content yeah. uh, that will be going out a little bit later on for our members. So, uh, Jamal, thank you so I've much. I've enjoyed and, uh, it. My pleasure. Catching a bit. Perfect.